Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience. It's a personal problem. Oh, my favorite kind. Mm -hmm. We can wait for Stormy, Stormy Daniels on Twitter till later. What's your personal problem? Yeah. So I have to go to a theme party tomorrow night. Now, this is what's bizarre to me because I live and die for theme parties and have not been to one in a long time. That tracks. But this party is at the Oakland County Boat Club, which is a private club, but it's a casual private club. Yeah, the air quotation marks in that one has me. Yeah, it's a casual or private club for like, um, what's the best way to put this? Like minded, open minded adults. What well, kind of club? Or is, is this just like a. I wouldn't have any this, dillemmas if it was that kind of club. Right. This is just a, we're getting on a boat named the Sea Biscuit and. Kind of, yeah. Crawling the shores of Lake, right. Lake Michigan. Okay. But it, yeah. But so the theme of this party, at first blush, one would think would be super easy, but it is actually the worst theme for me. It's an 80s party. Ooh. So if you I were actually, physical. well, but see, everyone's going to get physical. This is true. So if I were throwing an 80s party or attending an 80s party at people I know's home where I know most of the people and people aren't going to be like, what is wrong with you? Or they just mm -hmm. assume they already know what's There's wrong something, with something Right. I have had my costume planned for an 80s party, especially if it's a pool party, for like my entire adult life. Red bikini. That's what I was hair. thinking. Yep. That's, I was wondering if that's what's going to be it. Right. Yeah. So easy. So mm -hmm. perfect. No one else will do it because no right. one's crazy. Right. But I can't do that at the, although it's a boat club. Yeah. It does. Um, it's, I, also it's not April. This is true. Uh, there's a lot of, plus, you know, you're going with strangers. If it was a right. small gathering, an intimate right. gathering of friends and acquaintances, you could get away with right. that. I'm taking Uncle Mac. Well, they're, uh, Uncle Mac and Aunt Meller, who invited me to said party. Oh, what are they going as? I'm going to take him shopping after this to figure out what they're going oh, to go Oh, so he's got a, he's a blank slate. Yeah, I kind of want to tell him to put a bra on his head and have him be one of the guys from Weird Science. Oh, I was going to say you could have... Um, Mrs. Uncle Mac, I don't know her name, and oh. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna find out now. Uh, Mrs. Uncle Mac. At least you didn't Bikini. refer to her. At least you didn't refer to her as a uh, Marilee's sister. No, no, never. <laughs> uh, I would take say um, get Mrs. Uh, Uncle Mac to wear the red bikini and have him wear the long John Silver's outfit. I know, but as much as I love my aunt, I'm not letting her steal my outfit. Okay, fair. If I wasn't going, I mean, if she goes to a separate party, she can wear the bikini. Oh, it's like, go with it's God. It's like yeah. sisters and like Christmas, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hear <laughs> One you. of you okay. has to stay home. Right. <laughs>there's just the three of you going or are there other people in um, your in your coach uh your group? rachel i think is gonna go okay and dave so that, might go but that is a lot it's been, okay. but dave see the thing is if dave and i went to an 80s party because he could totally be i mean he's judge reinhold to a t personified right <laughs> what if you went as um, I mean, a also case, a if, dropout. A okay, so I athlete. thought about that too. So I've got okay. a couple thoughts there. But first okay. of all, I must go back to. I could do a whole Phoebe Kate's costume change. I need to have a '80s party because I also just realized mm -hmm. that if I was that if I hosted the '80s party, right, Captain could be Gizmo. I could be Phoebe Kate's, and Dave could be that nerdy Zach guy that doesn't follow any of the rules and ruins everything. That's a pretty good one, too. Yeah. Right. That would be a great one. But Captain doesn't get to go to this party. We don't know right. if Dave's going. So the Breakfast Club, I actually, there. I have a group of friends that we actually could completely mm -hmm. rock those costumes. But, but they're not all going. And um, secondly, it's 80 degrees out. And I would, although people would think I would be the princess, looks wise, I would clearly be Ali Sheedy. Which right. means I'd have to wear a long black sweater and a long, and that's not happening. Yeah, okay. So then I thought, like, rather than going as a character, mm -hmm. 
like then is it do I go like you said like the whole Olivia Newton John Jane Fonda route but I feel like everyone's going to be doing that Mm. or do you go like the metal chick route I also thought about if I was if I knew people at this party I would wear a long see-through white lace robe a la are you listening my host right a la my good friend may she rest in peace Tawny Katane right and come in in a jaguar rock into right. like some white snake but none of these are options so i have to go with like an a public consumption boring yep. costume i got it okay alexander haig secretary secretary of state under ronald reagan <laughs> no? no okay could you do something where that's themed to the iran contra scandal i mean that i could be ali north Oh my God, that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, I could get a Ronald Reagan mask and be like the I'm land saying. of yeah. confusion. Oh, yes. But then you'd, it's going to be I feel like if and you uncomfortable were here, for anyone if you're at the buffet eating with Ronald with Reagan's head like half up. I feel like if you were here, you'd have to be Maggie Thatcher and I'd have to be Ronald oh, Reagan. My God, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Not Dennis. No. Nope. Reagan, no. <laughs> um okay let's see what else what else could you be everything else that's instantly coming to mind is incredibly inappropriate i know and if i if like blonde rachel was still here and we had time to go shopping we could go we could be crystal and alexis mm. but i am wondering if i should go just of that era like that 80s era because i feel like and wear that dress i wore to nikki's gig in new york Mm, that would work Mm -hmm. and throw some shoulder pads in it yeah i'm trying to think if there's a golden girls theme you could do i'm not doing golden girls theme. rachel might be doing golden girls for hers that tracks my other thought was just a white t-shirt and a button-down sweater and go as ferris bueller i thought about that i also thought about getting a white button-down shirt and some ray-bans but -hmm. i think a lot of people will do that yeah that's that's low pickings you want something that really people Right. That either is just a look or it's got to be a really good character. Officer and gentleman. I have no gentleman. You go as the gentleman. I don't want to be a gentleman. (laughs) I could be Deborah Winger in that, though. I could be Deborah Winger in Urban Cowboy. I'm trying to think of like what's kind of wearing that tank top. Yeah. (laughs) What's. Because everyone goes early 80s. Right. I feel like when you think 80s, you think early 80s. You don't they think do. like 89. And they go like new, not new wave, but they do like pop 80s. They don't right. really think 89. Right. Um, which I thought about that. I actually thought I could do Madonna like a prayer. That would be good. Um, or Because I have that whole thing in my closet. No shock there. <laughs> what about... Uh, um, is it for you or dirty mind where he's just got the trench coat on and the it's dirty mind okay because again we're i'm trying to be conscious of the weather i know well the other i don't know why just everything i think of has me in a bathing suit but (laughs) the other one i always thought would be great Mm -hmm. would be although it'd be a pain in the butt you could only do it for like an entrance and then you'd have to take the one part off is the girl from the kiss video the prince kiss video right right yeah if you had a prince to like, do that weird roll it. around on the floor dance I thing wish. i wish i had someone who could be i'd right. be plus, apollonia plus you would be able to say i think i'm gonna dance now exactly yeah there's so many options i we should have ordered the prince sweatsuits i could just be like screw oh, it and worn yes. that yes dearly oh, beloved i know the healing waters like I, of like minnetonka yes i could i thought about getting like a really trashy leopard mini skirt which surprisingly i don't have in my closet yeah and like my really original motley crew shirt and be like kind of that but that's going to be a lot of people too like mm. there might be some hair metal people there right and they might not 
appreciate the detail to which it's going if it's like no. i'm doing tawny katane from this video or whatever it is right no the the, the great unwashed are not going to appreciate no the the attention so to that's detail. why i feel like i just have to go for a look crocodile dundee that would be amazing if my parents were in town i could do that in two seconds oh my god that would be amazing my dad's got a dry as a bone and the hat and everything This book is really interesting. I didn't know if I was going to be smart enough to read it, um, but I feel that way about a lot of books. Wow. But um, I, it's interesting. I feel like um, so much of the history of uh, helping couples conceive fertility, um, I always assumed it was really uncomfortable and bad for the women. And this book sort of <laughs> yes ands that theory. <laughs> Yes. And the fact and the fact that so much of this happened so recently. Yes. Yeah. It's super interesting. Um what was the thing that made you really want to tackle this? Oh, well, as you know, as we spoke a few years ago, I wrote this book on contraception for the same series called MAT Press Essential Knowledge. And there are books written for people who have an interest in a difficult technical topic like data science or computing or things like that, and who want a kind of a guide for an interested but non-specialist reader. And as I was working on my book on contraception, I also started thinking, are there books like this on fertility technology, just on the opposite? And I found out rather quickly that there are a number of books and articles on the sociology and anthropology of fertility technology or who chooses to use it and which technologies do they use and why and what it means for kinship and so on. But they were often very theoretical and they were often using appropriate but very com complex medical concepts. And I realized, you know, there's likely a market for a book about fertility technology that takes the complexity into account, but, and doesn't dumb anything down, but speaks about it in a way that a person who's not versed in these kinds of theories can understand and appreciate. Yeah, it's, and I mean, not to get away from you, but it's also adorable. Like it's an adorable little book. So you, it, you want to read it, but then you open it up. And then what you don't want to do though, and I is precisely what I did. There we go. Decide to curl up with a cup of tea and a Cadbury caramel egg as you're diving into some of the most horrific of them biting into a caramel egg is a little too <laughs> a little too on the nose a little too rough especially as a woman but but it is it oh, is goodness. super digestible not the egg but this yeah. as Luke said and there are some fascinating stories in it too that anybody would find amazing and like Luke said the whole I had to keep going back and going wait what year did this happen and it's like <laughs> in our lifetime mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, our adult mm -hmm. lifetime yep crazy yes yes how much of this did you know already as you know cocktail party fun facts and how much of this was stuff you were digging up and going I can't believe this um I had a decent grip on some of the earlier history from like the mid 19th century through about the 50s. So I had I had a some grip on the first first century, which is mostly artificial insemination and some of the main characters in that I mentioned in the book, like um, Alan Guttmacher and Robert Lato Dickinson, like major figures, particularly in the American history of um, reproduction, pregnancy and abortion. Um, but I did not know much about the history of IVF itself and about the kind of history unfolding as we know it, about the history that's coming up to 2022, 2023, really anything, any of the really high tech mechanisms that are now available in some countries to help with like embryo selection and things, things like that and uterine transplantation and very, very sophisticated ways of helping people uh, produce the children they want to have. And I 
had no idea about most of that. And it's really fascinating because it, in a way, gets it kind of the bigger question of who's who gets to choose who appears on the planet and, and who doesn't get to be here. And I don't grapple with that question on kind of a epistemological or theoretical mm -hmm. level, but that's kind of kind of in the lurking in the background of this is who gets to choose which which humans appear. Yeah, and I feel like you touched on that very lightly in some spots mm -hmm. where it's just the second part of a sentence where you're like, oh, I know what that means. Yeah. Um, and it's shocking to how much, um, especially in the first half, insemination really has not changed that much, if at all, in a hundred years. Like they kind of almost figured it out kind of early on. Yes, I think that's fascinating in that the first record of artificial insemination is not not much changed from the kinds of artificial insemination you can still do now. So one thread of this book is a history of similarity because you know, the technology doesn't change. Um, if you do it, you might want to get the sperm kind of washed and cleaned. Just a shout out to anyone who's listening. Um, or but, maybe not walk around with something inside you for a couple of days. Yes. Yeah. Not about that either. But the basic syringe, um, you know, doesn't doesn't need much, much tinkering. But a uterine transplant was not even on the minds of people in the mid 19th wow. century. So there is there paths. Is there a reason that this particular, you know, fertility is so seemingly under researched or not as developed as other sciences? Is it because it's mainly affecting women in one way, shape, or form? Yeah, I think it is well researched, but in within communities that have their own vocabulary and ways of thinking about them. So a lot of anthropologists and sociologists are looking at this very uh, closely because they're, I mean, especially in anthropology, like their main concern is, you know, kinship and family relations and who is related to who and who, who is a, who is a family and who isn't, who's in and who's out of a cultural group or a racial group and so on. So there is a decent amount of work done in academia, um, and there's also a decent number of advice books out there for people who are written usually by physicians who people you know who want a, a guide to you know how they how they should go about things. Um, but there's not kind of that middle middle ground of kind of a synthetic history of the techniques that are used, and that's what I wanted to do provide a reader in this book. It's, it's crazy. And I'm so grateful to this, like everything in this, because my, I'll, I've never wanted children, but I adore children. And my dear, like very dear, uh, several of my, my nieces and nephews were born through fertility treatments and watching my family members go through the agony and all of that. And, and I wouldn't have them. So I feel, you know, one step removed. I'm not a parent. I won't try to be a parent, but I am that the closest I'll be if these things weren't available and some of this crazy ass stuff and some of the really great stuff hadn't happened, I wouldn't have them. And I think that's so such a huge deal for so many people. But then you do get the people that are like, well, and all of us do contemplate the when are we mixing it up too much how are we it's a lot contraception's way easier just a great idea <laughs> the, the ethical conundrums are a little more more clear-cut with yeah. um preventing a pregnancy than with trying to make one I know people happen. have put problems with that too but in sure. the grand scheme when well, yeah. there's also the religious aspect which right. pops in too that the Catholic Church, which I mean, that's kind of par for their course. Um, so it wasn't super shocking. But the fact that they believed and kind of quite literally preached that this is how uh, this is how a baby gets made. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the twain shall never meet, we're not going to do it any other way. Mm -hmm. How much of that and that sort of religious belief, either in Catholicism or any other uh, religion, kind of did it delay any of the research here 
because that is such a huge issue already in these faiths? Mm -hmm. Not to my knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So it, IVF, of course, was developed in a number of different places, but um, the pioneer, most successful, pioneer, earliest pioneers were in uh, England and in Australia. And none of those practitioners um, were Catholics, Catholics themselves. No, that's how you get um, around it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the one, the one person for whom faith was a really um, key, key player in his, his thinking was John Rock, who was one of the um, uh, co-creators of the uh, contraceptive pill in the United States. And he, but he was, he, he took a stand against the Catholic church, even though he had a deep faith to say, you know, women are suffering if they're having too many children or children they can't afford or, you know, children that, you know, harm their health if they have more than, you know, even one or two or five or however many. And so he really is an example of someone who, I don't want to say challenged the church all that much, but he definitely had a, a, a wrestled with his faith about, um, developing the contraceptive pill, but he thought, he thought the contraceptive pill kind of melded just fine with Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. So, and he was one of the first people to, in the U.S. to try um, a kind of, a, a kind of, to see when exactly an egg um, made it into the uterus um, after, um, after an act of intercourse. And so one of the pictures, not very interesting pictures in the book is of of one of these one of these fertilized fertilized eggs. So, but he never he never took that research very far because he thought even in I think it was 1944 1945 this is going to take decades. I don't want to do this, <laughs> and so he kind of left the study study to the side. But in that was a very long answer to say the Catholic Church didn't really um, interfere much at all with the development of this uh, technology. And looking at it from sort of the various cultures and, and um, countries, is there any country through your research now or prior that really surprised you mm. with their beliefs on it? Um, I think maybe not a specific country, but it's it was really fascinating to discover how much nation states had to say in, yeah. in uses of different technology for different purposes and how the regulations in different countries kind of were an indication of what kind of citizens a country wanted. Because I think, you know, we've approached usually approach the world as individuals thinking, oh, if I want to have a baby, you know, I'm in my forties, I'm going to go get some Swedish sperm and I'm going to, you know, do my thing. But really it's so regulated in countries like China um, that kind of free will over having a baby via IVF is impossible. Yeah. So I found that really interesting, the ways that different states govern access. You know, I'm thinking of Israel also, which nice. makes IVF and um, embryos actually available to women up to their mid 50s. I thought that was super interesting section. And also restricting the rights of Palestinians to that same technology. Yeah. And so it's, a hundred percent it feels personal but all of these decision makings are these decisions are a hundred percent political when you tackle any project like this that's going to take some time and require a lot of research i feel like personally for me there's always those one or two stories where you're just like licking your chops anxious to get it in there where you're like i cannot wait to share this little piece with people what was the story or the kind of tidbits that you were really that kind of early on had lit the fire to go like, oh, this is a book. There's something here. Gosh, probably thinking about an, an early Dutch physician um, called Theodore um, Vandeveld. And he was a thorn in the Catholic Church's side for a number of reasons. But what I found interesting was he he thought this question was so fascinating that he just kind of threw out in his books just completely unproven ideas for improving 
improving the possibilities of fertility. And he thought, he wrote, well, why don't you try um, inter intercourse with the woman on top? You know, maybe Hell. the sperm will reach the uterus <laughs> with <it> more <laughs> vigor or something, something like that, which is <laughs> just total nonsense. But I thought, you know, I, it's another, but that instance really engaged me because I thought this is yet another area of technology where the innovation or the desire to create something to help people do this is really strong. And it's also, if you can find something that works, can be really profitable. Like him encouraging women to have, you know, sex on top of their husbands, you know, that's not going to make anybody any money, no, but more than that. <laughs> Somebody and, might have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, um, of course, but it's certainly not going to um, line your pockets. No, no. But, clearly, the these the devices, I guess, is the right word. Um, the syringes and such. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think here. Uh, J. Marion Sims, mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. I again, I was just reading this, being like, "Damn it! Here's what we should have put our name on." What the podcast name? <laughs> this uh, the Rells Obstat, like they got the. What's that? It's the one that looks like a, a bathtub. Um, oh yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. You're right. like they they got their yes. name on there and everything, so you it's cannot so forget true. that. Right, mm -mm. right, right. How uh, how what's the word I'm looking for? Um, proprietary is some of this these developments in this um in this field because there is so much money to be made in helping couples who are dealing with this or a person who's dealing with this is this uh for lack of a better term is this a fertile field for <laughs> folks to be going into um it's becoming increasingly popular especially in the past um, maybe five to six years it's becoming increasingly popular as an investment opportunity mm. and because the well, there's some tinkering around the edges of fertility technology in the 2020s. Really, IVF was, you know, established in the 1970s. The last major um, innovation that spread widely is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is was developed in 1991, uh, which where you take you can take one sperm and inject it in one egg, and um, identify that as a a pregnant um, for a pregnancy. Um, so a lot of these technologies are, for lack of a better word, in the public domain. Like you could, mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of specialized equipment to do some of this work, but where it gets more specialized is um, kind of on the edges of technologies. Like it, it, the UK is a particularly fertile Again, you can't avoid it. Yeah, um, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, place for this kind of innovation. So their um, companies are developing um, embryo speed imaging for embryos. So you can take an em a fertilized embryo and speed it, uh, speed up its development um, through AI and see how it might develop and look for potential um, abnormalities, um, especially if you have some kind of genetic abnormality and you don't wanna pass it on, you can run your embryos in this machine and as technician can look, say, look, okay, I think that one is going to, based on past AI of other people's embryos can look at it and say, okay, I think this is the best one for you. So that kind of innovation, if you can make it um, if you can do like randomized control testing on it, you know, you know, gold standards of scientific trials, you can make, you could just be like Donald Duck in his pile of gold coins. Um, um, Happy day. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of this, a lot of the um, kind of newer additions that people are trying um, just aren't proven enough. They're not tested well. There are a lot of people just kind of throwing spaghetti, spaghetti at the wall um, in search of kind of a magic, um, magic bullet isn't quite the right term, but just a, the, new, the next new big thing in, in fertility technology. The other thing that was fascinating, you talk about the fact that we are getting to a stage where you could, uh, for 
someone who is transgender implant an egg in someone who could carry it to term mm -hmm. who was identified male at birth yeah. but now identifies as a woman how far away are we from that happening um because that's like i mean there's the arnold schwarzenegger film junior but <laughs> i i that can actually happen maybe um that's probably some decades in the future because i think mm -hmm. there's and i guess as a historian i'm not good at i'm good at look I <laughs> right I'm not, yeah. I'm not quite as, as good as at predicting the, the future but yeah there are um people who are on the again either been further on the fringes of this kind of technological development where you might be able to derive reproductive cells from um, stem cells from anybody and put them together through IVF and then implant them in a living, a regular living person or implant them in an artificial uterus and have it gestate there and then have a baby that way. I mean, I think those are very far in the future, but I think they're not something that is off the radar. Probably not in our times, to be honest, but fair. Um, but people are a lot of people are laying the groundwork for this kind of pushing reproduction and fertility beyond what we could conceive of right now. Wow. Yeah. It's just it's so fascinating and it's so interesting. And it's something, it's a topic that uh, to be honest, at first blush did not kind of blow my hair back, but you start getting into this and you start going through these people and the, it's just, it's so interesting. And even again, I don't know enough about science to say like, this is a, um, <laughs> this is the timeline seems too soon or incredibly soon, but the idea of, um, tracking ovulation to even figure out when is a good that's relatively new all things considered am i just out of the scientific loop and i'm just i think everything was discovered by like marie curie and george washington carver and <laughs> no, no shade but like yeah. there's still folks doing stuff that isn't now is just taken for granted that's very much so. Um, yeah, the when an egg appears in a woman's menstrual cycle was only discovered in the 1920s, so just about 100, 100 years ago. So anyone who was trying to become pregnant anytime before 1924, and if you only if you read Japanese reproductive journal, so it's a pretty small group. Um, Self-selecting, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> nine, 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 it comes out in 1929 in, in German, and then it gets translated to English. So five years later, it's, it's more spread. But um, yeah, if you were trying to do any kind of AI um, before, before the 1920s, 1930, it was just a, a crapshoot. And you would, there, that didn't stop plenty of so-called physicians from telling people exactly when they should be either having sex or trying AI, um, most of which were wildly wrong and opposite of what would actually work. But yeah, really didn't come into public consciousness and, until about, about 19, 1930. And now it's super top of mind, I think, for everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it's completely at the forefront like all sides of it everything we've talked about yeah it, the, both you know personally politically all of the above mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so and fast it's, forwarded and it's it's all even just knowing when ovulation happens you know right part of you know teaching young people about you know menstrual menstrual cycles mm -hmm. and what's healthy and what isn't and when you need to go to a physician and you know, and all and all of that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, in a way, it seems a hundred years ago was sometimes seems like a long time ago, and sometimes seems like last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so and true. In your research, is that is that hundred years to you? Does that seem like, you know, Tuesday, or does that seem like? <laughs> you know? I don't know. I guess I've done a lot of research and maybe the first, you know, for probably 1900 to 1945, I really 
kind of that's an area a period of time in which I've 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 spent a lot of my um a lot of mental I spent a lot of my mental time in that in that era mm-hmm. and some of the arguments and ways not necessarily the technologies but the ways people were thinking about them still resonates now um like because a lot of people, you know, I'm just thinking back to contraception, you know, a lot of people were saying, you know, it's, it's a good idea for women to be able to control their own, yeah. uh, to become pregnant. And there are lots of people in 2023 who don't think that. Mm-hmm. And it's in a way, it's kind of maddening and, or astonishing that we as an Amer- American culture have to keep having the same arguments and defending rights that people identified a very long time ago as being pretty fundamental so yeah. so the question I'm sure I would hate to be asked after I <laughs> finish a book and months and months in research and, and writing mm-hmm. what's next do you know I do. Um, it's going to be a book on abortion. Oh, wow. Another so that's not going to be light topic, you know, yeah. a no, but, a, but a really and, interesting topic. And, and so I'll be looking at it again, from a global perspective, now that I've written two books of this sort on a technology from as many different perspectives as I can incorporate. And also given my language skills, which are limited to two, Um, I'll be looking at abortion from a theoretical concept called assemblages, um, which I won't kind of dig into in the book too much. But what I'm interested in doing is kind of taking abortion apart in a way from like, again, the mid 19th century through the present and looking just at all the different ways people have thought about what a fetus is, all the different ways people think about what a a pregnant person is all the and then another chapter and all the different techniques that people have used either before or after quickening or like you know when the fetus starts moving um and the meaning of that all the different ways people have looked at practitioners of abortion um either whether it's the the person themselves or a physician or a romantic partner or someone else um, are they helpers? Are they butchers? Are they murderers? Um, are they heroes and saints? Um, all the different ways those people have been looked at. And then having a final fifth chapter on kind of how, for lack of a better term, like kind of outside sources uh, or outside influences. So law and policy and philosophy and religion. Um, and looking at all the many, many different ways that or looking really for similarities and differences in abortion across across the world. And is it really kind of the same thing everywhere? Or are there distinct differences between having, having one in Ghana versus having one in India versus having one in Canada in the late 19th century? And yeah. are there and categorical differences or is this really the same thing? Is it really kind of simple in a way and we're, the world has just made this one procedure wildly complicated and weighted um, for its own purposes. Fertility Technology by Donna J. Drucker from MIT Press is available right now wherever you get your books. For more information, you can follow Dr. Drucker on Twitter, where she's at Hist of Sex. That's H-I-S-T-O-F-S-E-X. Why the Podcast is produced by the Professional Production Company. Please be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts because we're shallow and need constant validation. For more information, you can check out our website, whythepodcast.com. And like everyone else, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's show was recorded and produced by Heidi Hegquist and myself from our world headquarters, located on the second floor of the professional office building, centrally located downtown. Our reluctant executive producers are John Sauvey and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash.
We're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel? 